All right, so we're continuing. Thank you so much, Mate, for uh, being here with us and presenting your work um, with the UAC, which is looking into the development of metal of beta lactamase inhibitors. I forgot to mention before that both Tuve and Mate were part of the special podcast series that we released for the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, where they also present the projects briefly and in very simple terms in case you want to have a, another reminder of it there. And it's a great episode to listen to. So Mate, the floor and mic and screen are yours and looking forward to hear your talk. Thanks a lot, Eva, and thanks everyone for joining this seminar on such a nice sunny Friday afternoon uh, with all this new snow. Um, we are one of the uh, groups that recently joined the uh, Uppsala Antibiotic Center and are really excited about becoming a part of this interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary environment. And uh, it was a lot of fun also to listen to the talks about your projects uh, a few days ago at this retreat and getting to know at least some of you and discussing with you. And uh, now I would like to show you uh, one of our ongoing projects uh, which uh, target, uh, targets metallobetalactamases. And let me start with the most important uh, namely, thanking my group who uh, did and do a, a fantastic work in the lab. Uh, we are a, a group of um, very well people with very different, uh, diverse backgrounds. And uh, this is also one of our strengths that uh, some of us are organic chemists, some of us are more biochemists or NMR spectroscopists, and all the projects help each other. And those who work on the antibiotic resistance project are Hermina and Kate, and I will mostly present uh, their work, so two uh, small projects. And it is Kinga here who uh, joined our group thanks to the uh, funding from the Uppsala Antibiotic Center. She just arrived in September, but has already done a, a very impressive work and soon we have her first uh, compounds to, ready to be tested. And Jan Luca is an Erasmus student who works together with Kate uh, on uh, the synthesis of some inhibitors. And he's also a, a very, very talented and uh, a super nice person. And you may wonder what the others do in the group who don't work about antibiotics. And I don't want to take much time, just show you very quickly what type of projects we work on in case you wanted to collaborate with us. So we work, for example, with something called halogen bonding, which is uh, very similar to hydrogen bonding with the main difference being that it is much less well known and applied but otherwise is, uh, it is as directional and nearly as strong as hydrogen bonds, and they can be used uh, to stabilize the secondary structure of peptides or proteins. They can be used in catalysis in organic chemistry. So this is an area where we uh, work a lot. We also do NMR method development. Uh, for example, are working on this so-called paramagnetic NMR tool, that allows the identification of protein binding sites and binding modes of uh, drug candidates with a 100 to 1,000 times higher sensitivity than the standard techniques that we have today. We also do so-called experimental molecular dynamics. So we look with uh, spectroscopic methods at how molecules move in solution. And of course, and this is not just a, a game for a physical organic chemist, but we can, for example, use this technique to explain why certain molecules that should not be able to penetrate membranes are capable of uh, penetrating uh, through biomembranes. We also isolate a few hundreds of natural products from East African herbs every year. And uh, 
Uh, this has been a hobby project 10, 15 years ago, but it has really grown. And uh, we have <clears throat> over 2000 natural products now. And it's not just a, a research project, but it's also a, a way of supporting East Africa. So we have trained about 50 PhD students from East Africa, and many of them are now associate or assistant professors and are running their groups in Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and we are of course extremely proud of them. And these are just four examples. If you would like to collaborate with us here, you can find more about our projects and just drop me an email. Uh, it's, we are very, very open for uh, new collaborations. But let's turn back to antibiotic resistance now. And let me start with uh, giving you a very uh, short uh, well, view on how we, how we see antibiotic resistance and how we want to attack it. So if you look at the history of bacteria and humans, we have lived together with bacteria for a long, long time. And <clears throat> we had a, a, a lot of diseases that basically kept control of the human population and uh, caused a lot of suffering. And as a result, slowly we have developed antibiotics and we have learned the importance of hygiene. And this has truly contributed to the population growth. Uh, basically, we have four doubled our population the past hundred years. And there are, of course, a lot of other factors, but I believe that antibiotics are one of the most important factors for this progress. But sadly, not just we develop, but of course, bacteria as well. And the bacteria learn to handle or weapons, the antibiotics, and learn to dismantle them. And that's, of course, a huge problem for us. And the question is how we go on from this point. And there can be a lot of different strategies. And I believe that we need all of the different approaches. Uh, there is no single strategy that will solve the situation. But uh, of course, each uh, academic group has a chance to maybe contribute in one or two ways. It's hard to solve the entire problem. So as a chemist, we could basically make more efficient weapons, so to say, uh, better antibiotics uh, that work in another way than the previous ones. But this has been shown to be very, very difficult. So another approach can be to disarm bacteria from the weapons that bacteria uses against our weapons. So basically take away the mechanism that causes the resistance, the biochemical roots. And we, in our group, uh, found this way to be most attractive and started to look into what kind of resistance mechanism would be most interesting to attack. And there are a couple of smart ways a bacterium can protect itself from more, from more antibiotics. And uh, <clears throat> each of them would be worse to attack, but we thought that this inactivation of a drug by bacterial enzymes is uh, an area where we really could make a difference. And we looked into metallo-beta-lactamases. This is a group of the so-called beta-lactamase enzymes that basically open up the so-called beta-lactam ring of antibiotics. Uh, and thereby make them inactive. And this ring is, if you look at this uh, picture with a lot of structures, this ring is uh, responsible for the bioactivity of uh, this uh, compound. So we cannot make uh, antibiotics that work in this specific way inhibiting the building of the cell walls of bacteria without having the beta-lactam ring. And historically, people have just varied the structures around the beta-lactam ring. And uh, unfortunately, bacteria has learned to dismantle this ring specifically, which specifically is needed for the bioactivity. And in order to, and of course, I mean, these uh, <clears throat> beta-lactamases are very important because they attack the 
historically most important, largest and cheapest group of antibiotics that we have in our hand. And uh, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, priority list of the uh, World Health Organization, you can see that the priority one group contains bacteria that all have the so-called carbapenem resistance, which is a type of beta uh, lactamase uh, or caused by a type of beta lactamase enzyme. So these are all having a beta lactamase. And also the priority two and priority, priority three groups have uh, <clears throat> many bacteria in these groups have beta lactamases. So in case we could inhibit these enzymes, we could reactivate the beta lactam antibiotics and extend their lifetime. So we could uh, use them again in the clinics in a combination therapy with the inhibitors that we develop. And this would surely be a, a big step that could maybe uh, give us 10, 20, or 30 years in the future until bacteria learn to handle the inhibitors that we develop. And that, that could be really important. So we thought that we would develop uh, beta lactamase inhibitors. And uh, the strategy that we uh, wish to follow is that we uh, wish to identify the key biochemical step or process uh, that we want to inhibit, uh, identify the active site of the enzyme that dismantle the antibiotics, design inhibitors that should fit in into, into this binding site. And these uh, first inhibitors, we expect it to have a micromolar activity, it's really hard to make better inhibitors just as a, a first guess. And then having this in hand, gain structural understanding of how these inhibitors bind to the enzymes, how do they inhibit, and using this knowledge, uh, modify the original structures and make them uh, more active to have higher affinity and better selectivity. And of course, there is a long, long way even after these first steps that we are experts on. And probably these are the steps that some of you uh, know way better than we do, how one can uh, then take further these molecules. And in order to, to reach these uh, later steps, we started with looking at beta lactamases. And, uh, this is the so-called Ambler classification of beta lactamases, uh, which is based on their structures. And there are A to D classes, uh, which have certain similarities. But the main difference here is that there are so-called serine beta lactamases and metallo beta lactamases. And they all dismantle beta lactam rings, but in a, a slightly different way. So looking at the serine beta lactamases, they use a, an amino acid called serine and its side chain in order to open up the beta lactam ring by making a so-called nucleophilic attack at this carbonyl group. And with help of water, uh, it hydrolyzes the ring, opens up the ring, puts in a hydroxyl group at the carbonyl and the proton at the nitrogen and converts the antibiotics to an inactive form. And the enzyme simply regenerates and can then take the next antibiotic molecule. So this is really troublesome, but luckily there are already a number of inhibitors. And out of this, clavulinic acid is actually uh, an orally an active inhibitor. So there is no uh, major need of developing new ones. So we drop these uh, enzymes and instead looked into metallo beta lactamases. And these use zinc ions, one or two, in order to deactivate the uh, beta lactam ring, or for example, carbapenems. And here you see that this enzyme transfers uh, hydroxyl ion to the carbonyl, similar to the serine beta lactamases. And basically using also water, it deactivates the uh, antibiotics in a similar way to the serine beta lactamase and regenerates itself so that it can again take the next antibiotics in the next round. 
And this group is really troublesome. There is no clinically applicable uh, inhibitor for this group. And um, there are a number of enzymes that uh, are widely spread, especially in China, India, and in generally in Asia. And uh, we expect that in uh, maybe 10 years or uh, a bit more, uh, this uh, resistance mechanism will be transferred to more and more bacteria uh, worldwide. And of the <clears throat> hundreds of metallobetalactamases, the so-called NDM1 and VIM2 are two of the most important ones clinically. So NDM1 stands for New Delhi Metallobetalactamase and VIM2 for Verona Integron encoded, encoded Metallobetalactamase. And we decided to focus on these two enzymes simply because these are the clinically relevant ones. And I would like to show you two projects, uh, starting with the development of a VIM2 inhibitor, uh, and I will follow up with an uh, NDM1 inhibitor development then a bit later. So VIM2 was isolated from uh, Pseudomonas, uh, and uh, when we looked into the literature, we actually found a promising molecule that had a low micromolar activity, but uh, there was very little knowledge about uh, this molecule. So it was published as a resumate. So this is really a mixture of two molecules with two different orientation of this bond. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, nobody knew at the point when we started to work with this molecule, which of the two molecules is the uh, one that is responsible for the beta lactamase inhibitory activity. There was no toxicity data, and the authors of this papers could, paper could not um, crystallize uh, the inhibitor together with the protein, so there was no X-ray structure. And we also noticed that there was no NMR assignment for uh, this enzyme. Uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, is an uh, alternative technique for, to X-ray crystallography in order to figure out the structure of uh, drug protein complexes. So there was quite some, uh, quite some challenges remaining. And we started this project with resynthesizing the inhibitor. And uh, <clears throat> this work was done by Albin uh, under the supervision of Hermina. And uh, basically, for those of you who know chemistry, it's an alkylation in the first step, reduction with uh, borohydride, then <clears throat> a nucleophilic substitution to make this thioester, then hydrolysis selective hydrolysis of the ester, and then we used chiral HPLC in order to separate the two substances, the two stereoisomers. So we had then uh, a large arrangement of both stereoisomers in our hand. And the next step was to generate the enzyme in a pure form so that we could um, study the interaction of this inhibitor with the enzyme in solution, as it is difficult to crystallize it. The, the best method is then to look at it in solution. And it's uh, about 30 kilodalton protein. We expressed it from E. coli. Uh, in C13 and N15 labeled form, and also in N15 labeled form for later studies. And here you see a so-called proton nitrogen HSQC spectrum, where each of these red dots, so-called cross peaks, represent the amino group of, or one amino group in this protein. So there are 266 dots cross peaks here. And uh, the main question is which uh, peak belongs to which amino acid, because if we know it, then we can see which of these uh, peaks are affected when we add the inhibitor, and that will tell us where the inhibitor binds. And you can think so that uh, we <clears throat> want to walk through the amino acid sequence of the protein. So we need to try, need to find a starting point, one amino acid that we can identify a cross peak for. And then we want to go to the left and right and left and right and basically walk through the peptide sequence. 
And somewhat simplified, you can think of that this is like uh, checking for the raisins in a cake. So if you have a cake with a lot of raisins and you want it to identify where the raisins are each and every one in the cake and you want it to know which other raisins are nearby, then you can describe it in a three, in a three dimensional coordinate system. And we call one of the axes uh, as proton NMR, the other carbon NMR, and the third, the nitrogen NMR. So it basically corresponds to the atoms in the backbone of the protein. And we want it to know uh, which uh, nitrogen is bound to which hydrogen and which nitrogen is close to which carbonyl carbon and so on. So we need to find uh, a way to walk through the protein sequence and identify each amino acid. And I will try to show it in an easy, simple way. So there are different uh, protein NMR pulse sequences that are used to make these connections between the atoms. There is a, a so-called pulse sequence in NMR that is called HNCO, which just does what it says. It connects a hydrogen to a nitrogen to a carbon a carbon. So basically it tells us for each amino acid, which uh, proton, nitrogen and carbon and carbon are close to each other. So each red blob here will correspond to one amino acid's NHCO connection. And then we go one step further and use a pass sequence, which is called agency ACO. And this will transfer magnetization from the proton on an amine of an amino acid to the carbonyl in the same amino acid. So here in previously in the agency O, we saw the carbonyl of the next amino acid in the sequence. In agency ACO, we can see the carbonyl of the same amino acid in the sequence. So we walked one step to the right. And then we use agency OCA, and this will connect the nitrogen that we looked at to the alpha carbon next to the carbonyl that we detected in the agency O. So we got one atom towards the left. And then we can use a pulse sequence that is called HNCA, and this will connect the NH of the next amino acid to the alpha carbon that we just identified in the agency OCA. So with each spectrum, we can take one step to the left or the right, and then we can again start looking into the agency O spectrum. It's the same spectrum that we looked at before, just that we now want to connect the NH that we just discovered in the agency A to the carbonyl of the next amino acid. And we can just continue going from agency O to agency ACO, agency OCH, agency A again and again, 266 times. And then we have identified all the nitrogens, protons, and carbonyls of the backbone. It's a, a very tedious job, but uh, Hermina has done a, a fantastic work on it and has identified all these atoms. So you see that we could assign 84% of the backbone, the parts that are uh, marked with green. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to identify a certain cross peak if it's very much overlapped, or it can be that due to dynamics of the structure, it disappears. So therefore it's not 100%, but with an 84% assignment, one can really go on for further towards further studies. And here you see this um, spectrum. This is a so-called proton nitrogen uh, heteronuclear single quantum coherence spectrum that connects the nitrogens to protons. And these are the number of the amino acid in the sequence. And this one letter is a code for the type of amino acid. So V stands for valine, T for threonine and so on. So this is the way we work. We assign each and every peak here. And the next step is then that we want, then we want to know how an inhibitor binds. So we took one of the uh, molecules that we synthesized 
and titrated in into the solution of the protein. So we added larger and larger amen stepwise and looked at which of the signals that we assigned moved. So here you see the red peaks are the uh, peaks of the protein itself, and the orange peaks are those that move upon the addition of the uh, inhibitor. And this move can be quantified by uh, so-called chemical shift perturbation, which is basically looking at the change of the position of each peak, uh, the proton and the nitrogen change with a certain weight, weighting factor. And plotting it, uh, the chemical shift change against the position of the amino acids in the protein, we can see which are the amino acids that are most affected by this little molecule that binds in. And we are, of course, most interested in the amino acids that show the largest change, because these are that are directly interacting with the molecule. And then, of course, this interaction will also cause a larger structural change in the enzyme. So we see a lot of small changes as well, but these are just induced changes upon the binding. So we could identify uh, the about five amino acids that are most important in the binding within the molecule. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, not just identified which of them are the important, but we could also, uh, by doing this titration and following the change of chemical shift, we could uh, calculate the binding affinity of these uh, ligands. And we did this experiment for the so-called S and R enantiomers of the molecule, and then also for Coptopril, which is a known inhibitor, uh, not very strong, but it still inhibits uh, uh, VIM2. And uh, so that the 1S isomer is the one that, is, uh, that has high affinity, and this must be the one then that um, has, uh, or that is responsible for the bioactivity of the molecule. And the, uh, we also checked for the toxicity and saw that it's uh, about a, a factor 100 difference between uh, the two uh, molecules or between the toxicity and the uh, affinity. And we also note that this molecule has a slightly better affinity than coptopria, so it's uh, really worse to work uh, further with. We also correlated the chemical shift changes of coptopria to the chemical shift changes that we observed for the two molecules, and so that there is a linear correlation, which means that these two molecules bind in the same binding site where coptopria binds, and uh, <clears throat> this helps us in, identi in identifying which of the amino acids are interacting with the inhibitor and will allow us then to uh, optimize the structure of the inhibitor to uh, gain higher affinity. I wonder, Eva, how long time do I have left before I jump into the next project? Uh, you have, yeah, about maybe five minutes left. Okay, then I will be quick. Thanks a lot. So <clears throat> we uh, also tried to develop inhibitor uh, for NDM1, which is also a, a very important enzyme clinically. It is, uh, this enzyme is common in E. coli, in uh, Pseudomonas, in uh, a couple of gram-negative bacteria. And uh, it is <clears throat> responsible for carbapenem resistance. It has about the same size as VIM2 had, and it is also very difficult to crystallize because it's dynamic. And at the point where we started working with this enzyme, uh, there was no NMR, ex ex an a NMR assignment available. So therefore, we did the same. Anna expressed the protein with uh, nitrogen 15 and C13 labeling. And we went then on and uh, looked into the enzyme and tried to design an inhibitor that would fit in the uh, binding cleft close to the sink. And we partly used uh, the knowledge from known inhibitors uh, of uh, beta-lactamases and also looked into the uh, intermediate when the enzyme cleaves antibiotics and combined the information and came up with two types of molecules that we wanted to synthesize. 
and uh, Kate has synthesized uh, nine components. Uh, I will not go into the detail of the synthesis, but uh, she found or developed a, a rather efficient route with a three-step synthesis for one of the group of compounds and five-step synthesis of the other group of compounds. And we have then tested uh, these components in uh, collaboration with a group in Tromsø in Norway and identified a few of them that had uh, <clears throat> a reasonable affinity to NDM1. This affinity is not very high. Some of these compounds turn out to be actually be better against GIM1 or VIM2, but we wish to understand NDM1 because this is one of the most challenging enzymes. So we went on. And Kay did the assignment of NDM1, and she achieved about 94 to 95% of the um, amino acids. Um, and we could then use, use this assignment in order to uh, do chemical shift perturbation studies. And just as in the previous project, we titrated in uh, one of the inhibitors and followed which amino acid showed the largest chemical shift changes. And we identified those uh, amino acids then that interact. We also saw that this enzyme is very dynamic and that makes that even amino acids that are quite far away from the expected binding site show some uh, chemical shift change due to the induced structural change. So this made the identification of the binding site rather uh, difficult. And therefore we used an other NMR technique, which is called NOSI, so nuclear overhauser effect spectroscopy, where we can transfer magnetization from the inhibitor through space to the protein and then back and detect it and identify which amino acids are very close to the uh, atoms, certain atoms of the uh, protein, uh, yeah, to the protein. So we identified these two um, protons here in the inhibitor and identify the amino acids that are close to each other or close to them using this HSQC nosy technique. And with this, we could uh, suggest a um, uh, binding mode of this inhibitor, pointing out the amino acids that interact with uh, the uh, different functional groups of our inhibitor. And of course, knowing which amino acids are close by and interact will help us then to further develop this molecule to a higher affinity inhibitor. And this is, of course, ongoing now. And I guess that my time is uh, pretty much over. So I just would like to point out that this uh, has been about uh, two times three years work that I presented with a lot of uh, people involved. It was Kate and Hamina who did the majority of the work and Hannah who has been a postdoc in our group uh, has uh, also helped them a lot. And then we had, uh, <clears throat> master students, visiting researchers, and a couple of collaborating groups who helped us with bioassays, with uh, sent us plasmids for the uh, expressing the protein and so on. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for listening. And I am really excited about your questions. Thank you so much, Mate, for this. Uh, presentation. I have to admit that a lot of the chemistry kind of was a little bit like detail for to understand really the deep concepts of it, but it was really great to see the whole process and see how is it that you are actually finding how the different parts uh, kind of relate to each other and they really bind and try to find the mode of action that way because I personally I did know about crystallography but I didn't know so much how this method of structural uh, chemistry works. Very nice. So we have Philip here asking, um, great talk. What is the pharmacophore of BIM2? Do most NDM1 chelate the metal in the active sites via the pyridines and extend the activity? Yeah, <clears throat> let me go back. So uh, <clears throat> basically in both enzymes, of course the uh, active site is around the sink. So we know that the uh, uh, zinc ions are involved in the cleavage. And uh, <clears throat> let me see if I have a figure. 
No, I don't have it here. So if you look at this chemical shift uh, perturbation uh, graph, uh, you can see which amino acids are involved. No, I admit that I don't know it by heart exactly which, but uh, the cysteines are holding the uh, zinc ions. And then there are some uh, hydrophobic amino acids like uh, phenylalanines and tyrosines that are uh, making the hydrophobic interaction to this phenyl group. And then we have some hydrogen bond donors. I have to admit that I don't know by heart exactly which amino acid it is, but it's of course in this uh, ECS Matchemlet paper that is just on the way, way out. Um, we have uh, Per Jim had uh, raised his hand. Per, can you open your mic? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Hey, Sorry Pam. if I sound grumpy. I've been ill for a couple of days. Uh, yeah, no, so I was just wondering, so the structures you showed are crystal structures, or is this a homology structure, the first one? No, these are uh, basically NMR structures. So what we do is, of course, um, if there are crystal structures uh, already for the protein, then we use this when we start the NMR work. So we don't want to do a 3D structure determination when we know uh, how the protein will look like. Just basically use the assignment. And then when we have the assignment and the chemical shift perturbation studies, then we do a flexible docking, allowing both the protein and the ligand adjust. And we dock the structure, I don't know how many times, let's say 100 times, and then select the binding mode that best fits to the NMR data. So these are... Uh, so the structure, structure of the protein? Yes. So yeah. basically, the, I mean, you take the protein, you let the ligand come in 100 times, and both the protein and the ligand will slightly adjust. And then you look into the NMR data and select out the binding mode that fits best to the data. Yeah, but the original uh, structure, so it, it, you have solved the NMR structure. Yeah, so I mean, basically uh, there are different ways depending on how much you know of the protein. If you know nothing, then you need to do uh, a three-dimensional three structure. And then it's not enough with the assignment. If you have previous information, for example, from a crystal structure, mm, then okay, you can simply do the assignment and presume that the structure didn't change much. So, so it's sort of a homology structure. Yeah, you can say so. So it's, uh, and all these uh, metallo-beta-lactamases homologous, they share their common ancestor and structure. Well, to a certain degree. So there are like 4,000 or maybe even more than 4,000 beta lactamases. And some of them, um, and if you go back to this Ambler classification, uh, you see that there are four groups um, that show I mean, in the, I mean the metallo beta lactamases. Pardon, the metallo, yeah. They <clears throat> also have subclass B1, B2, B3. So some of them have one sink, some of them have two sinks. and for example, between NDM1 and VIM2, there is, I think, about 30% structural similarity, but they belong to the same subclass then. So, so they are likely of common origin, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, so my final question was really then, because I know it's really hard to do this drug-based drug design, and I'm no expert, but especially when the more dynamic proteins are, and to get high affinity, so I guess as a devil's advocate, advocate, I would just ask, isn't it easier to screen big libraries to get inhibitors? But it must have been done for this class of enzymes, I would think so. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, others have done it and we of course wouldn't have the resources to do it. So we rather use our brain, so to say, yeah. than uh, use the luck. Uh, there are other groups also looking for metallobetalactamase inhibitors, but nobody has been successful. And one of the main reasons is that, as you say, these enzymes are so dynamic, especially NDM1, that they are hard to co-crystallize and uh, they are very difficult to uh, do NMR on as well, mm -hmm. because we see that as soon as the inhibitor binds in, all the amino acids start to move. There is a larger structural change. And then the enzymes are not very stable. So for example, NDM1, we can run about three, three and a half days on, and then it decomposed. 
and then we have to take the next sample. So it's not, not an easy task. Yeah, I see. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bert. Um, we have another question in the chat by Tushar saying, how do you calculate the concentration and activity of metallobetalactamase enzymes in bacteria? So, I mean, what we do is, and we just go to that slide, is that we, um, so here we are. So basically in this graph, each point is uh, the chemical shift change of one amino acid. So let's say that uh, out of this, um, 300 amino acids, three show the larger chemical shift change. And then we, when we add the inhibitor stepwise in different concentrations, then the chemical shift change or the intensity of the uh, peak, depending on how the um, inhibitor binds, will change in a fashion that gives the binding curve. And then using this equation, we can calculate the binding affinity. But of course, we have more than one amino acid that moves when we add the inhibitor, which makes that we can uh, talk about an affinity range. So if we have, for example, five or 10 amino acids that show such a curve, then some of them are a bit closer and will experience a quicker change. And some of them are further away, they will uh, change less and slower. If we combine all the data, then we get a range of affinity. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, usually corresponds quite well to uh, the affinity that you can measure with other techniques. So if you think about, for example, uh, ITC, then uh, uh, usually you end up in the same ballpark, just that you get one single value. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. And as a last thing, we have Maria with her hand up. Maria, can you open your mic? Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. I was just curious again, like Per, about your, your um, structures. So did you try for these proteins to use uh, alpha fold and see if you get even better starting models or are the, the structures that you show, are they actually the structures of these particular, uh, of, of, of exactly the same sequence? Yeah, so <clears throat> as uh, there were crystal structures available for the pure protein, and okay. we could start with them. So there was no okay. prediction. But uh -huh. of course, if we wouldn't have had it, then mm. uh, alpha fold would have been a good option. Mm. Okay, no, it wasn't clear to me if it was exactly uh, that sequence or if it was a homologous one. Okay, thank you. Lovely. That was great, perfectly on time. So very thankful for your presentations, both Tove and Mate, learning a little bit more in detail about your projects and for. Uh, for two of us, all the luck for the dissertation and uh, for matters, all the luck on developing, you know, this project to completion over the next four years. I know it's hard, hard work, but uh, quite some time to get there. And of course, you are welcome to seek out also collaborations and help throughout our center, obviously. Um, I wish to see you again in one of our activities. And I remind just everyone listening that our next webinar would be in January, in uh, 14, Friday 14th. So the first week of January, we do not have the webinar. It will be the Friday 14th of January. And with this, I conclude this seminar and I wish you all a very happy, happy Christmas, right? That's the next thing coming up. Thank you everyone, bye.